Hi, I hope this video finds all of you viewers well. This is Brandon Van Dyke, president of the Mill Series, and given that we are about to begin our programming for the 2019-2020 academic year, I wanted to give you a brief recap of last year's events as well as a quick preview of some of our upcoming ones. We kicked off the fall semester with Stephen Hicks, professor of philosophy at Rockford University and author of the much-discussed book Explaining Postmodernism. In his September visit, Hicks characterized postmodernism in depth and analyzed its rise in the academy. Here, he argues that postmodernism has far-left origins, having originated in the 1950s as a response on the part of Marxist intellectuals to the failures of socialism. And when you read the documents and the discussions among people in the far left in the 1950s, it is a crisis of faith, a fundamental crisis of faith. And the claim then is Marx's predictions they're crap. It's not scientific. The capitalists are doing well. Of course, we've got all sorts of criticisms, but they are so puny and insignificant compared to the criticisms that we can make about what happened in the Soviet Union. Our next event in October featured two nuclear security experts, Matthew Kranig and Andrew Koh, professors of political science at Georgetown and Vanderbilt universities, respectively. Kranig and Co. debated the merits of the Iran nuclear deal, with Kranig arguing against the deal and Co. in favor of it. During the Q&A, both were asked whether they predicted nuclear war in the foreseeable future, and they gave contrasting answers. A nuclear war. <sighs> well, I don't know anything about 500 years from now. Um, I think it's pretty unlikely in the next few years, at least I'll call it the foreseeable future. Um, for simply the reason that everyone understands these things create massive, tragic massacres that almost everybody regrets having happened after the fact, even if it seemed exigent at the time, and that demands very severe punishment in return. And so as long as we have a world in which there are some states who are willing to uh, pay costs to punish others for aggressive, terrible international behavior, that's unlikely to happen. On um, nuclear war, I think the, the risk has increased in recent years. Russia is relying more on nuclear weapons in its strategy. Uh, North Korea's nuclear arsenal is expanding. And I'd have to say, if you, if you ask me, gun to my head, um, will I s I'm 40, so in the next 40 years or so, will I see a nuclear weapon used? I'd, I'd bet yes. Our next event in November featured two experts on Venezuelan politics, Javier Corrales, professor of political science at Amherst College, and Margarita Lopez Maya, professor emerita of development studies at the Central University of Venezuela. Lopez Maya detailed Venezuela's descent into patrimonial dictatorship, while Corrales analyzed the country's utterly catastrophic economic situation. Here, Corrales, drawing on the work of Indian economist and Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, attributes Venezuela's economic crisis to the very erosion of democracy described by his co-panelist. Democracies, liberal democracies, go through economic crisis almost more frequently than we want to. But democracies have a built-in mechanism for <coughs> correction. It doesn't always work. Sometimes the correction doesn't emerge or the solution that is being provided is not the right solution but there is no other regime in the world that has an explicit mechanism for an opposition to the state to get organized, do a campaign, and defeat the current team and replace it with another one. This became impossible to do in Venezuela as it transitioned away from liberal democracy. Several weeks later, we hosted Angus Johnston. Johnston is a social justice advocate, proponent of identity politics, and historian of student activism who teaches at Hostos Community College in New York City. Given that the Mill series has generated some controversy at Lafayette, we invited Johnston to offer a critique of the Mill series. During his visit, Johnston met with numerous students who are critical of the Mill series, and in this clip, he reports some of what he heard. But one of the things that I have heard multiple times in my day here uh, is that there are a lot of people on this campus, and maybe not a majority, maybe maybe it's a relatively small minority, but, but I, I have heard from multiple different people in multiple different contexts that they believe that the controversies around the Mill series are, are making the conditions of debate and discussion and community on this campus worse, not better. 
In February, the Mill Series hosted Coleman Hughes, young writer and 2019 graduate of Columbia University. The thesis of Hughes' presentation was that two competing visions, which he calls anti-racism and humanism, underlie many debates about race in America today. In this clip from the Q&A, Hughes argues that media outlets like the New York Times in recent years have not accurately portrayed the diversity of opinion that exists among black Americans regarding the impact of racism. 52% of black Americans, according to a 2016 Q poll, say that uh, racial, racial discrimination, discrimination has had virtually no effect on their chances of success in life. Mm. And 60% of blacks with no college degrees say the same. Mm. And I guess my, my response to that would be, do you believe that they are right? I think it's a non sequitur to say because someone, because 60% of a group believe something, therefore it's true. Um, my point there was not to argue, not to make that logical fallacy, but to say that why is it the case that when I read the newspaper, I never hear that point of view articulated? We're talking about 60% of black people without a college degree when polled saying something that I could not think of a single New York Times op-ed having argued, ha having argued that claim. In March, we invited Jaron Brook, chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, and Sam Arnold, professor of political theory at Texas Christian University, to debate the relative merits of capitalism and democratic socialism. In this clip, Brook summarizes the variant of capitalism that he endorses. Arnold then counters that Brook's vision is extreme, that his ideal economic system is significantly more laissez-faire, for example, than even the United States economic system. So capitalism is the system in which economy and politics are separated, in which all property is private property, in which the state does one thing and one thing only, and as protect individual rights. Protect individual rights in the way somebody like John Locke would have conceived of individual rights. Just, just notice what an extreme position he's defending. Um, any, I take it you're defending an economy with no, with no state involvement whatsoever. So that is, that's setting the bar high for you, um, which I know you know, um, but I want to make sure they know. Um, think about all, all of the things that government does, um, not in spooky Venezuela, uh, but in USA, baby. Um, all the stuff that, uh, that the government does right here to promote, I'll use your, your concept here, freedom, which as a liberal egalitarian, I hold dear to my heart as well. Finally, also in March, we invited Patrick Deneen, professor of political theory at Notre Dame. Deneen came to discuss his widely read and reviewed book, Why Liberalism Failed. Here, he discusses one way in which certain Amish communities maintain strong neighborly bonds, in contrast to the increasingly atomized mainstream American population. I find the Amish to offer a really sometimes powerful counterexamples to exactly what I'm talking about. So it's useful that certain members of Amish religious communities forbid members of that community from taking on insurance. They believe that when you're living life with, with all the attendant risks, that you should be able to rely upon and be obligated to the members of your community, that when something bad happens, you have to make them whole. So if your house burns down, you're going to have to spend some Saturdays rebuilding their house. So those were last year's events, and looking forward, we've got some really exciting events lined up for the academic year just beginning. First, on October 7th, we host a screening of the documentary The Rise of Jordan Peterson, followed by a Q&A with director Patricia Marcoccia and producer Maz Gaderi. Then, on October 30th, we host a conversation between journalist and filmmaker David Fuller and journalist Kathy Young. The two are going to discuss the famed intellectual dark web, comprising figures such as Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Joe Rogan, Douglas Murray, and Eric and Britt Weinstein. Next, on November 6th, we host journalist, podcaster, and editor Jacob Siegel, who will present on the changing face of anti-Semitism in the United States. Then, excitingly, on November 15th, we host world-famous social psychologist Jonathan Haidt, along with one of his critics, Jeffrey Sachs. The two will debate the claims put forward in Haidt's recently co-authored book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Rounding out our fall schedule, author and blogger Matt Stoller will visit on November 21st to discuss his book, Goliath, which concerns the dangers of monopolies and is due for an October release. We are still firming up our spring schedule, but in March of 2020, we host journalist, editor, and author Sohrab Amari, and we plan to talk to Amari about current debates within America's religious conservative community and, relatedly, his much-read article in First Things entitled Against David Frenchism. 
We are looking forward to a great year. And for more, check out our website and YouTube channel and feel free to contact me or Saeed. Thanks so much for tuning in.